Welcome back everyone, today we are going to make secondary alcohol called benzhydrol via a Greek nut reaction. I originally planned to make modafinil and atrophenol from it, but because I don't know if this is legal, I am going to put that aside. Instead, we might use it to make a molecule called tetraphenyl ethylene, which fluoresces nicely under UV light. Anyways, without further ado, let's begin. For today's preparation, a lot of chemicals are needed. Firstly, 110 ml of anhydrous diethyl ether and 100 ml of normal diethyl ether for the extraction will be needed. Besides that, 30.3 ml of fresh benzaldehyde, 34.9 ml of bromobenzene, 7.35 g of Greek nut great magnesium turnings, an iodine crystal, 37% hydrochloric acid, 29 ml of this, distilled water and 10 g on hydrous magnesium sulfate will be needed. If you look carefully, you can see that I only placed one bottle of diethyl ether down. Well, because we still need some anhydrous diethyl ether and because we need to dry the bromobenzene, we are going to use molecular sieves for amolecular sieves for the bromobenzene and sodium metal for the 110 ml of diethyl ether. I don't have anhydrous diethyl ether on hand, but only this 99.5% diethyl ether. Therefore, we added about 110 ml of this diethyl ether to this glass bottle and afterwards we need to dry it. To dry it, we are going to use sodium. Sodium is a fire hazard and it can ignite on its own, therefore it's stored in the secondary container, a fireproof steel can. To keep the sodium from oxidizing from air exposure, it is usually kept under a layer of paraffin. The paraffin was removed using a piece of cloth. The sodium is really soft and it can be cut up using a knife. If you look closely, you can see these small bubbles. These are made from hydrogen gas. Sodium reacts with water to form hydrogen and sodium hydroxide, which are both insoluble in diethyl ether. To dry the bromobenzene, sodium cannot be used as it would simply react with the bromobenzene. Therefore, we used a different drying agent, 4A molecular sieves. A little more bromobenzene than actually needed was measured out and added to the bottle. Both the diethyl ether and the bromobenzene were left to dry overnight. The next day, the solvents were dry and we were ready to begin. So we began by weighing out the magnesium. The Krignard grade magnesium has a purity of 99.99% and we weighed it out in this glass container. The reason this glass weighing container was used and not just a beaker was that it can be covered to make it airtight. This way the magnesium won't oxidize any further. This is the apparatus we are going to use. A reaction container, a pressure equalizing addition funnel, a reflux condenser and a calcium chloride drying tube. Prior to the reaction, the apparatus was heated to remove any last bit of moisture. Grignard reactions are extremely water sensitive and even the water that sticks to the glass could interfere with the reaction. Using this powder addition funnel all of the magnesium was added to the round bottom flask. It was tedious to stuff it all in but we managed to do it. To keep reagents even more dry, sieves were added to the addition funnel. Before proceeding the reflux condenser was flushed with water. If I don't do it now I would probably forget it later on and the ether would just escape as a gas. Our bromobenzene after 24 hours of drying is now completely dry and it was added to the pressure equalizing addition funnel. The pressure equalizing addition funnel has a volume of 100 milliliters. Therefore it won't be able to fit as much ether as I wanted it to, but we measured out about 60 milliliters and added it to the bromobenzene. I originally planned to add about 30 milliliters of diethyl ether to the magnesium, but this turned out to be way too little and in total we used about 150 milliliters. I still had more anhydrous diethyl ether in stock than I showed you in the beginning and this anhydrous diethyl ether was added later on through the reflux condenser. To destroy the oxide layer of the magnesium, a small pellet of iodine was added. Once the iodine started dissolving in the diethyl ether and destroying the oxide layer in the magnesium, a small amount of the bromobenzene ether mix was added to this magnesium ether iodine mix to get the reaction going. You can see that the Greek nut reaction began by looking out for any gas evolution. A Greek nut reaction is exothermic and the gas that is produced is diethyl ether gas. In the first part of the reaction, Bromobenzene reacts with magnesium to form phenylmagnesium bromide, which is a water-sensitive Greek nut reagent. 
Greek knot reagents are only stable in an ether solution. You can use THF, diethyl ether, some other ethers also work, but it won't be stable if you boil off the ether and hope to recover some powderized Greek knot reagent. We tried to keep the reaction as calm as possible. If it became too violent, biphenyl would be formed as a byproduct because the Greek knot reagent can also react with more bromobenzene. For good temperature control, a water bath was used, and to keep it even colder, some ice was added later on, and a steelfish was also added. I don't know why, but I cranked stirring up to the maximum because it somehow amused me, and it's not going to interfere with the reaction anyways. Once the contents of the reaction flask weren't boiling anymore, the fresh benzaldehyde was measured out. The benzaldehyde was then added to the addition funnel. Some splashed over into the reaction flask, as you can see here, but this shouldn't be a big deal. The benzaldehyde was added really slowly and the solution was kept as cold as possible. I also added some ice water occasionally. All of this brings us to the second part of the reaction. The Greek nut reagent we prepared before now reacts with the benzaldehyde to form a new Greek nut reagent. As the reaction before, this one is also extremely exothermic, meaning that the ether will start to boil. If the benzaldehyde is added too quickly, the ether might boil over. Once all the benzaldehyde has been added, we set up for reflux to drive the reaction to completion. Diethyl ether has an extremely low boiling point, which makes it so dangerous as a flammable solvent. I always find it mesmerizing to just touch the apparatus because it is nearly cold to touch. But there's boiling liquid in there, isn't that cool? Anyways, after half an hour of refluxing, the heating mantle was turned back off and we waited for everything to cool down. The apparatus was dismantled and this big ass funnel was attached. The round bottom flask was placed into a cold water bath and we slowly added a lot of crushed ice to have ice cold water. During this step our desired benzhydrol and this other insoluble product are formed. To get the insoluble product into solution, we are going to add some dilute hydrochloric acid. We measured out about 20 milliliters of distilled water and afterwards added about 30 milliliters of 37% hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid reacts with the magnesium hydroxide bromide or whatever this stuff is called to form water and magnesium bromide chloride. This magnesium salt is water soluble, which makes the cleanup a lot easier. All of the contents were then transferred to a separatory funnel. The bottom aqueous layer was drained off, but we didn't discard it yet. As you can see, the top ether layer has a beautiful yellow color, but this is actually not good, because these are just impurities and the product shouldn't be yellow. After keeping the ether layer in a separate flask, we decided to get more product out of the aqueous layer. Therefore, we added 100 milliliters of ether, shook the funnel, drained off the aqueous layer again and added the ether layer to a different flask. You don't even want to know about the smell. We did this in a very well ventilated area, but everything smelled like ether. The water layer was washed one last time using 50 milliliters of diethyl ether this time. Especially with solvents like diethyl ether, it is important to vent the separatory funnel occasionally between shaking sessions. Diethyl ether has a low boiling point and therefore it will build up a lot of pressure. Here you can see all of the ether layers after I combined them. We did a single wash using sodium carbonate solution to get rid of any leftover hydrochloric acid, afterwards did a distilled water wash and in the end added an hydrous magnesium sulfate to get rid of any water. It would be ideal to do another washing using sodium metabisulfite solution because this reacts with benzaldehyde to form a water soluble product, but I didn't have any sodium metabisulfite, so we skipped this step. Originally I planned to use 210 milliliters for this entire preparation, but we ended up using 300 milliliters of diethyl ether, which is more than I expected, but it's okay. Using an hydrous magnesium sulfate should get rid of any water in the ether solution before performing a distillation. Then we performed a simple distillation to recover as much of the ether as possible. Heating and stirring were turned on and here you can see the ether collect. If you did this inside you would probably end up blowing yourself up because ether vapors are flammable and a lot of vapors are produced. After boiling off all of the ether the product remained liquid for at least an hour and afterwards it decided to solidify. 
The product ended up being yellow and I don't know if it's actually pure, we will have to recrystallize it. In total we recovered 50 milliliters of dirty ether and 200 milliliters of ether which should be quite pure. I stored it over sodium to make it even purer again and to prevent the formation of peroxides. As you can still see bubbles, the bottle was occasionally vented to let out pressure. Of course our product still looks somewhat dirty, therefore we melted it again and transferred it to a beaker. Heating and stirring were turned on and we later added even more distilled water. Our goal is to get rid of as much of the yellow impurities as possible, but unfortunately by funnel isn't soluble in water. We still decided to go with water, the TLC will reveal how pure our product really is. A long period of heating and stirring was followed by decanting off as much of the distilled water as possible, afterwards adding even more distilled water to get rid of more of the impurities and decanting that off as well. The beaker was placed in the fridge until the product solidified and the last bit of water was decanted off. I put my finger into the beaker because I didn't want the product cake to slip over into the wastewater. The big piece of product was placed into a filter paper and onto a towel to dry. Unfortunately I can't use my vacuum chamber to speed up the drying process because, well, you saw it, the vacuum pump broke. A small amount of pure commercial benzide roll and a small amount of the homemade benzide roll were added to two small tubes. Afterwards half a milliliter of ethanol was added to each of the samples and the samples were shaken until everything has dissolved. Due to my glass cutter being suboptimal, the TLC plates, well, it didn't look good. My capillaries are also way too big and therefore the TLC spots became huge. For good results, thin capillary tubes and perfectly cut TLC plates should be used. Under UV light you can see the spots. With such big spots you are not going to get good separation, but we should be able to prove that we got benzide draw. Acetone was added to the speaker and in order to get air saturated with a lot of acetone, the beaker was covered with aluminium foil. Before inserting the TLC plate, the beaker was allowed to stand for 10 minutes. One edge of the TLC plate touched the solvent too early and this is going to interfere with the results. Some of the contents in the TLC spots travel faster than others while the solvent is rising. Under UV lights we will be able to see that. And there you go, the TLC spots are more or less on the same height if we include all of our errors and this proves that we made benzide roll. The benzide roll might be purified even further by recrystallizing it from petroleum ether, but I'm not even going to bother because I now have 500 grams of benzide roll with a known purity. If you liked today's video make sure to drop me a like and if you don't want to miss out on further chemistry content like that, make sure to subscribe. I also have to thank all of my Patreon supporters. You guys make it possible for me to film even cooler projects for you to enjoy. If you want to become a Patreon supporter too, make sure to check the link in the description. I wish all of you a great day, until next time.